welcome to In The Room, where we explore the elusive world of casting for film, TV, and commercials. Join us as we interview directors, writers, producers, and actors, taking a deep dive into their experiences with casting and how the ultimate decisions are made in bringing a story to the screen. Get an inside look at casting and find out what really goes on in the room. From here, something you want to say. I will tell you this in these territories, men will come try you, they will take from you until you are wiped clean from this land. I'm just saying that's something you might want to keep in mind. You think? standing guard in one of the last great open spaces. That looks like a promising place. The place I might be able to see myself. You just have to stand at the river, and you can see what the men and the women up there see. That's what drove us across the ocean to this country in the first place. Hope. Lieutenant, there's no reason for you to stay here. And here you are. The men who hunt this land, they're not going to share it with you. What you build, they will burn down. We just got to keep going. Someone's gonna take that gun and wrap you with it. What? We talked enough. So, my name is John Williams. I am a casting director, and today, we have actor, writer, producer, extraordinaire, Todd Allen. He has appeared in close to 70 films and television productions. That's 70, that's 70. He has recently com completed ke filming Kevin Costner's Epic Horizon and American Saga parts one and two, making it the fifth time he's worked with Costner. He's also slated to appear in Horizons parts three and four. Previously, Todd worked with Kevin Costner on three films and with Robert Duvall on The Apostle and again on Broken Trail in which Allen received excellent reviews in Territorial Marshal Bill Miller. Is that an award? No. No? Okay. No, no. Oh, you played Marshal Bill Miller. Okay, Marshall got it, got, Bill got Bill. it. I was like, is that what? Uh, via his independent production company. I should have gotten an award. He should have, for sure. He should have many awards. Virtuosity Media, he has planned a number of exemplary film and television projects, including some 14 feature projects, 11 television projects, two documentaries, and a number of alternative television projects. Todd recently completed writing and will make his di di directorial debut. I'm not a great reader. Uh, with the feature screenplay, Six Mile Creek, the story of a veteran suffering from PTSD who must overcome his own demons to save this woman and daughter he comes to love. He will also executive produce the epic long form television project, Sarita, a true story of girl's journey into Mexico to track down her brother's killer set on the Texas-Mexico border during the 1920 Prohibition era, a UFC-centered television series project, The Torment, sought after Spaghetti Western, Crown Valley, look at... <laughs> It just goes just on and going, on, man. man. Sorry. It just goes on and on. Sorry. Uh, yeah, it is a it, you have a, a, a massive career and, and I know you pretty well and uh are a, a real hustler in the industry. And and the one thing I wanted to start off with that I don't I don't know, I knowing your background being what is it, fifth generation or fourth generation Texan? Uh Six or seven. Six or seven generation Texas. And knowing where you come from, like, did they, when you told your 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 family, hey, I'm gonna move to Hollywood, did they say, No, you're not? <laughs> like, how did this, uh -oh. how did you get started? Oh, that's a good story, man. I, you know, um uh the short answer is my mother burst into tears and said, Well, it's about time. Uh my 
my father didn't speak to me for almost two years. <laughs> <laughs> Both of them are gone now. But uh, yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting story. I was, um, you know, I was a business major at the University of Texas. And I'm, I'm, you know, my youngest daughter is now 18, who you've met, Shelby. And she just got into UT. So she's going to go there in the fall. And she will be the 10th member of my family and the fifth generation to go to that school, which is awesome right. for me. It's awesome. Um, and Shelby wants to be a sports agent. Yeah. So she's already interviewed with Coach Sarkeesian's wife about take, getting a job and blah, blah, blah. So she's she's going to be done. I mean, yeah, you're, you're one of the most Texans uh, I know, I think. Uh, yeah, man, I go way back. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the to answer that question, I'll, I'll try to do the short version no, you're good. of we got story, time. man. But it's, you know, I was, I was, I was sort of the chosen one to take over my dad's business empire. He was really big in the insurance industry here. Um, uh, was the president of the state board of insurance and was all of that. And, you know, I had all the, all the tools really, uh, you know, the personality skills and the conversational skills and, you know, to sort of step into that, that role and into that business. And I was in the business school and I was making C's like in business statistics and business law and, you know, accounting and like, and I, I was like, and part of the reason of that was, you know, I was also in a fraternity and there was too many parties and too many beautiful girls at the University of Texas. And, and you know, how focused I was, I, I can't tell you, but um, I would take electives in the school of communications, you know, speech, marketing, sales, entrepreneurial stuff, and make straight A's, straight A's. And I was, uh, I was confused. I was like, man, what is, what is wrong with this Had a knack picture? for it. It came easy. Didn't have to, you yeah. know, could still party. And, 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 <laughs> and literally I was at my fraternity house having fried chicken one day and I didn't have any afternoon classes. And I, I was in a quandary about what I was going to do. I was a junior I was right at the end. It was like May of my junior year. I had a week to go uh, of school and I was in a quandary and I, I didn't know what to do. And I knew what my father wanted me to do, but I didn't, I, I didn't really want to do it. Right. And uh, we had a ranch out in the hill country outside of Austin, uh, you know, hour away um, uh, between uh, Johnson city and Blanco. And that ranch was, like my savior, uh, that's where I would go. I could think, I could bail hay, I'd sweat my ass off. I could, I don't know, can I say four yeah, letter fine. words in here? Yeah, you're good. Um, you know, I could fix fences, I delivered baby calves. Uh, you know, I, I took through a shotgun in the trunk that day to go out and see if I could find some birds. Yeah. You know, but that's where I would go to think. And I was by myself. And I'm, to this day, the worst job I've ever had was cattle fencing. Uh, it's hard. It's hard. <laughs> it's bailing hay in the middle of August yeah. or July. Dude, my, the entire football team said they were never going to be my friend again. <laughs> my, my father recruited them and, and gave them watermelon. <laughs> he was such a cheap ass. Oh, my God. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm driving down the highway, and I, I, I'm 80 miles an hour, man, and I, I see a bunch of big trucks on the side of the road at somebody else's ranch, not our ranch. I was not, hadn't reached us yet. And I saw what looked like, in those days, the movie lights were, you know, four feet across. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're huge. And I can't tell you why, but I turned that corner, man, and, and pulled off the side of that road. And the next thing I knew, I was out of that car and I was walking. And I looked like a frat boy because I was. I had jeans and boots and a starched white shirt, and I looked just like a frat boy. Right. And um, I walked up to the gate, and there was security and a couple of assistant directors there. And they mistakenly thought I was the son of the property owner. And they go, oh, man, this is so great. This is so great that you came out. What is your name? And I said, my name's Todd. And they go, Todd, this is great. Come on in. Do you want to meet our director? And I, <laughs> I go, yeah, <laughs> I swear to God. So they lead me to the director who I didn't know it, but he was an Oscar winner. He was an Oscar <laughs> winner. It was a big movie. It was a big movie. So this is May of 1980. Yeah, yeah. Right. So they lead me over to this director, and I, you know, today after almost 80 movies, I know how busy that man yeah, was, yeah. but I didn't know. 
So I'm asking him questions. Why is that light pointed that way? And why is the camera like that? And he was answering me. And after a couple of, he thought he had to be nice to me. Yeah, for sure. And after, you know, a couple of minutes, he smacks me on the shoulder and he says, hey, Todd, you want to come rehearse the actors with me? And I go, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> he just walked off. So, so this guy's six foot six. He's, he's a towering human being. And so I walk over with him and there's a group of actors sitting under an oak tree. And I knew who all of them were. It was Willie Nelson. He was the star of the movie. You gotta be shit. No. And Diane Cannon, who was married to Cary Grant at the time. Steven Spielberg's first wife was sitting there and, and some other people, right? And I knew who all of them were. Just fucking pulled off. And the, and, the, and the director goes, hey, everybody, this is Todd. He's going to help us rehearse. <laughs> <laughs> and they all, they're all waving at me. And, and the director said something like, Todd's dad owns this ranch. Everybody give him a hand. And Willie Nelson knew the owner of the ranch, and he knows I'm not his kid. So Willie's winking at me and giving me the thumbs up the whole time. And I'm, I'm going, my face turns red, and I'm like, oh, man. So there was a young couple sitting they're all on the ground and there was a young couple probably mid-20s that had roles in the movie they were actors they flew them in from la and the director goes all right everybody got their pages we're going to look at scene 34 um it starts off with you two and these people are you're you're three feet from me and that's that's how close they were to me and i'm standing up with the director who's six foot six and he goes so it starts with you guys so you guys are going to start off the scene and um uh, I don't want you to act. Just say the words. Just I just want to hear the rhythm of it, you know. But don't act, okay? You got it. And kid, everybody shakes their head and nods their head rather. And he goes, "Action!" And they start going. And this this kid can't do it. He's like acting up a storm. Right. And the director goes, "No, no, no! Cut, 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 cut!" He goes, "Listen, don't act. Just can you just say it? Can you talk to her?" Just let me hear the, yeah. the the rhythm. Oh, I've been there. I know. <laughs> and um, you got it? And he goes, the kid goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's his response. Yeah, yeah, I got you. He I goes, you. action. And he can't do it. And the director goes, cut, 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 cut. And all of a sudden, I, Willie Nelson has leaned over and whispered to Diane Cannon that I'm not the son of the property owner. And she's now looking at me with her arms crossed like this going... And smiling like really big, like oh, this is gonna. And they be, see where this, this is, is, is going to be going. fun. <laughs> and so my face is red, and I'm and I feel six foot six director. His name was Jerry Schatzberg, and he was an Oscar winner. Uh, I feel him staring at me from the side, and I literally I had to turn and look up like this, and he's just looking at me, and he says, "Do you remember his lines?" And I go, "I think so." He goes, can you say them to her? And I said, you want me to say his lines to her? And the kid sitting three feet in front of me goes like this. <laughs> Dude, this is like out of a movie. My career is over <laughs> kind of moment, right? And, and, I'm, and I've, I've, I was a little bit shy. I'd never been on stage. I never did the school play. I'd never thought about acting. I didn't know what actors did. <laughs> Fuck it. So he says, can, can you say his lines to her? And I go, I think so. And he just looked at me and went, action, <laughs> action. And I'm sitting there and Willie Nelson is going like this, thumbs up, winking, going, this is going to be fucking funny. And I look at the girl and she's looking at me, waiting for me to speak. And I, I, I know my face was beat red because I was a little bit shy. And course, I yeah, didn't like, everyone's looking at everybody's you. staring at me, right? And somewhere in the back of my mind, I thought, I can't just say these words. I think what I'm supposed to do is make her believe me. And the line was what some young dumbass cowboy would say to a, uh, his girlfriend in a small Texas town. And the line was, darling, when I get my truck out of the shop this afternoon, I'm taking you dancing. That was the line. And I thought, I don't think it's about the truck. And I don't think it's about the dance. This is happening like, uh, like this. Yeah, and the yeah. director is with his arms crossed. Everyone's staring, Willie Nelson. They're staring at me. They're all staring <laughs> Walked at me. In. And I literally did not speak for 15 seconds. And she's sitting on the ground. And, and I, I can't, I don't want to stand up here, but um, I hunkered down 
like yeah, squatted yeah, down, yeah, yeah. like almost on a knee yeah. so that I'm eye to eye with this girl and I'm not speaking. And the director is just watching me and I'm mentally undressing her. Cause it's, to me, it's all about, I want to get in your yeah, pants yeah. later. Yeah, yeah. And, and my eyes are sparkling, but I'm not speaking. And I said that line, super chill, super under my breath, like darling, when I get my truck out of the shop this afternoon, I'm, I'm taking you dancing. It was like that. That chill. Yeah. And she lights up like a Christmas tree and says whatever her line was back. And the director goes, takes his arms literally to the crowd and goes, and that's how you do that. And Willie Nelson's looking at me going like, thumbs up. Like, this is fucking great. This I is can't fucking believe, great. I can't believe it because it's you. But I can't fuck. And, and so I'll, I'll cut this short, but if, a couple of minutes later, we left and the assistant director, he called the assistant director over, who's a guy named David McGifford, who I'm still friends on social media with 42 years, 44 years later, uh, who was pro arguably one of the greatest first ADs ever in history. And he never wanted to be a director, so he just did right. huge movies yeah. from that point forward. And David walks over to me and says, hey, Jerry, the director wants to know if you would like to be in this next scene which was a different scene. And I go, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they take me over to the extras table and I had to sign the little card and they're going to pay me 25 bucks, right? And they, he walks me through the crowd and there's 700 extras. Jeez. And as we're walking, he goes, this is a big scene. There's seven cameras, so don't break. And I, I didn't know what that, what that meant. meant. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know what it meant. So I'm like, uh, okay, okay. So he leads me through the crowd. There's 700 extras to this girl, a different girl. And he goes, Leslie, this is Todd. Todd, this is Leslie. Um, originally, Leslie was going to dance by herself here because in the movie, her boyfriend is the drummer. And it was Willie's real drummer. They gave him all bit parts right, of right. the movie. And it was a barn dance scene with 700 people and seven cameras. And in those days... The cameras were yeah, this yeah. big, right? Yep, yep. So he goes, oh, and, you know, remember there's seven cameras. And uh, he goes, oh, uh, Jerry wanted me to tell you when you dance with her, you guys stay kind of tight. Don't get out in the crowd and dance like blind dance or anything. And um, stay kind of here where you, where you are and make her boyfriend in the movie not like it. Can you do that? And I go, I think so. So he walks away and I'm looking at Leslie and I'm going, Hey, how are you? And, yeah, and she's, she's going, I'm good. I'm good. And, and, you know, I go, can I ask you a question? She goes, yeah. I go, what does don't break mean? And she, she looks at me like, what? And she goes, it means there's seven cameras on us and we're always on camera. So don't break character. That's what that means. And I went, Oh, Oh, okay. So, we're exchanging pleasantries and over a pool. Like, What's character? <laughs> and I, and I look up and Willie's tuning his guitar and grinning, <laughs> grinning at me. Like, I can't fucking believe this kid. And, um, over a bullhorn, I hear action and Willie and the band, bam, they start going and there's banks of speakers. It's like a concert. Yeah. It was loud. And I'm three feet from Willie, who's on the stage right there. And Diane Cannon's out dancing with somebody else, kind of circling around behind us. And I'm 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 looking around like this, like, shit, this is a movie. I but it was so loud, I wasn't prepared for it. And I kind of froze, right? So I look over and I see Leslie looking at me like, Yeah, let's go. Like, Dude, we're we're supposed to dance. And so I go, oh, shit. So I jump over and I grab Leslie and we're dancing. We're like 10 seconds in. And I, I got her like this. And, you know, I'm thinking, okay, don't go out and, and get, get in the crowd. Stay tight. So I'm here. And, I'm, and then 15 seconds in, it hits me. Oh, my God. I'm supposed to make him not like it. And I don't know what acting is. And by that time, the director gets there and he's not smiling. And I really thought here, 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 he's yeah. going to get rid of me right now. And he looked at me and said, who told you to do that? And I looked at him and I said, I, I'm so sorry. I know I've already apologized to Leslie. I, I know I ruined that shot. And he goes, no, no, no. I'm, I'm asking you a question. Who told you to do what you did? 
And I looked at the assistant director who told me to dance with her. And I thought to myself, you know, 30 minutes ago, I was eating fried chicken at my (laughs) fraternity house. This guy makes his living in Hollywood. I'm not throwing him under the bus. Yeah. So I looked at the director and I said, you know what, man? Nobody told me to do that. David said, you wanted me to dance with Leslie and make that guy not like it. And I couldn't get him to pay attention. So I, I did something and I made him pay attention. And that director was just staring at me, just staring at me. And this is May of 1980, a week before the end of school. I'm a junior. I'm 21 years old. And he reached in his back pocket and pulls out on this before cell phone. Yeah. Right? He pulls out his billfold, thumbs through it like that, and he hands me a card and said, that's my private number in L.A. When you go home tonight and you think about what you did here today and you decide that this is what you're going to do for the rest of your life and you move to Los Angeles, you call me and I will help you. And seven days later, I pack my car and move to LA. And, and now I'm, you know, I've done almost 80, 80 movies and a hundred TV shows. And yeah. And he did help me. He guided me to an acting class and cause I didn't know shit. Yeah, yeah. But seven days later I showed up in LA and you know, I, when I got, I'll just tell this when I, when I got there, I didn't know where to get off the freeway. I drove into California with my car was packed. I had my snow skis on the back of my car. Cause I'm a fucking idiot. Yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. And my stereo and the rest of it was jeans and cowboy boots. That was it. And um, I drove until the freeway ended, which was the beach in Santa Santa Monica. Monica. Yeah. yeah. And I thought, fuck, I've missed Hollywood. (laughs) I don't know where it is. So I I park and literally I park in a parking lot and I don't know where to go. And I'm walking. I take my shoes off and I'm walking in the sand on Santa Monica Beach by the pier. Yeah. And I turn around and look back at the mountains and I see the Hollywood sign on the mountain. It was kind of a clear clear day. day. Well, it wasn't as polluted. (laughs) So I go back and get in my car and I literally get get myself on a road. I think it was La Cienega where I could keep the Hollywood sign framed in my windshield. And I drove until I hit a dead end. Yeah. And it was Sunset Boulevard and La Cienega. And that's where I rented my apartment that day, that moment, right then. It was a piece of shit apartment. Yeah. yeah. And I, I I put my stuff in it. And um, that building is still there today. Yeah, I was, just, I, I was trying to and, remember and I, what's it last I ago. literally walked out onto the sidewalk and I could see between buildings down this, and the lights were coming on in the city and the sun was setting. And I looked to my left and I see some giant, huge billboard like they do on sunset boulevard with you know the a movie that's yeah. coming out and i looked the other way and i saw another I rented one. that billboard on sunset for a movie <laughs> and and I, I i literally i said these words out loud i i'm looking at all of this and just thinking about what i was doing a week before in austin texas and i and these words came out of my mouth and i said literally out loud i got this I got this. And it was like a message to the universe. And I, 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 I took off. My career started so fast. Well, I got in an acting class. I got an agent at the time. They were the biggest in was the that world. The, was that the class with uh, Quentin? Or? No, the Quentins came after that. Okay, okay. Um, that. This one was at the Beverly Hills Playhouse. Okay. It's a guy named Milton Katsilas. Yeah, 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 famous. I mean, famous, yeah. famous class. And they didn't even want me. And and I kept going, knocking on the guy's door. And I finally said, dude, this is the class I want to be, be in. And he, he said, I, fuck. And he picks up the phone. He goes, let, let this guy named Todd Allen in. He's from Texas. I don't fucking know. Just let him in the class. It's Jesus Christ. And he hangs up the phone. But but when I said those words, I got this. It, it, I don't know, man. It was a signal to me. It was a signal to the universe. It was a message to God. I don't know what it was, but I mean, it, the it whole was thing true. is so fucking cinematic. It was true. It's so cinematic. I, I, everybody says I should write a book. Yeah, you a hundred percent. Because I know this is just one like couple hours of like just amazing stories from where from there to here you well I'm, I'm old enough you know i've been doing it long enough that i got to meet all of my idols 
Gregory Peck, Robert Mitchum, John Wayne, Lee Marvin, Ward Bond. I mean, all those guys. I got to meet them, spend time with them. It was great. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, my, my film... I. My film debut was literally opposite Kirk Douglas. The first thing I ever shot on film as an actor it was one scene. Well, I, outside of the, the, the film. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, but that was as an extra. And, yeah. But, and, and the thing I shot with Kirk didn't come out until after my, the second thing I ever put on film was a movie called 48 Hours with yeah, yeah. Eddie Murphy and yeah. Nick Nolte. That and was that, your second job? Second job. And, but the, that came out before the other one. But so the first time I ever sat down and had a scene on film, it was Kirk Douglas. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty good. I don't usually get dumb struck. You know, I did once with Gregor, Gregory Peck when I first met him. I was like, fuck, it's Atticus Finch, you know, and I couldn't speak. I'm yeah. like, uh, uh, uh. And um, I had one line with Kirk Douglas, one line. And I was a sheriff's deputy in this shit town. And it's a long shot with a steady cam back when the steady cam rigs were huge. And Kirk drives in and comes up this long driveway and they switch over to the steady cam and follow him up the steps and into the sheriff's office. And he walks up and said, I'd like to see the sheriff. And and I, I had something to say, like, well, he's not available right now. You you want to have a seat? Something like that. And we do the shot. I'm ready. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm dressed in my sheriff's deputy outfit. And long shot. Kirk drives up. They pick him up with the steady cam. He comes in, says this line. I look up, and it's Kirk Douglas looking at me. And I think to myself, "Fuck, it's Spartacus." Yeah. And I was, I couldn't speak. I didn't say a word. And the director goes, "Cut, cut, cut, cut." Runs yeah. over because what is there a problem? And I go, no, 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 there's no problem. All right, he goes, all right, let's reset, which is a long shot, long, long reset. Shot. So yeah. Do the big reset. Yeah. Same. Kirk comes in, <clears throat> need to see the sheriff. My mouth hangs up, but I can't do it. Can't. Not a word comes out. Cut, cut, cut. The director runs over and he goes, do Do you need like a magazine or something? <laughs> and I go, no, no, no. And Kirk goes, everybody just take five. And this is a magic moment for me. Kirk Douglas walks over behind me, and I'm sitting in a chair at the desk and starts rubbing my shoulders like 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 a shoulder neck yeah, massage, yeah, yeah. right? And he goes, like a good friend would do. He it. goes, first time on film, and I go, yes, sir. He goes, you a little nervous? I go, yes, sir. He goes, happened to me too, my first time. I couldn't I couldn't speak. He goes, listen, kid, and he's he's just rubbing my shoulders. And he leans down kind of to the side and I look over and it's Kirk Douglas who's yeah. right here, right here. He goes, all you got to do is look me in the eye and tell me the truth. And I go, well, I can do that. He goes, let's go. And he says, Todd's ready to go. Let's reset. Director goes, okay. Kirk drives up the driveway. Steady cam picks him up. He walks in. I need to see the sheriff. And I go, well, he's not available right now. You want to have a seat? And the director goes, cut. He goes, what the fuck? Why couldn't you do that before? And that was the best advice anybody ever yeah, gave Yeah, for me. sure. Look me in the eye and tell, tell me the, the truth. truth. Yeah. And it's, I, I mean, that's my the, whole that's career the, is built on, on that. that moment. Yeah. yeah. Swear to God. And that's where you start trying with your auditioning and meeting everything. everything. Yeah. Everything. That's changed my life. Yeah. I understood acting in that moment. In that moment. Yeah. 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 Now to do that is not the easiest right. thing in right. the world. So you get 48 hours, you get that. And then let's fast forward to sort of when you come into like you and Kevin come into to, to play. Yeah. So uh, it's a good story, man. I, I won't tell the whole thing, but I, I, I'd gotten bit parts um, like 48 hours. You know, I had one scene um, and that led me to get my second, uh, the third job, really, which was 48 Hours, and I played Gene Hackman's which, son. Which was, a, I mean, at that time, it was a massive it hit. It was a big movie. Yeah, it was a huge hit. And that led me, and every time, it was the director would call his buddy, who was about, about to direct another movie, and it was that one. And then that director called Jonathan Demme and said, I got the guy for you. And they were looking for a young Marine in this movie called Swing Ship. It, and it, it, ha it happens a lot like that. A lot, yeah. That's how it happened. yeah. And I, but I, I did things that other people didn't do. You know, I hand wrote thank you letters to people, the director, the casting director, the producers. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'd get phone calls from these people saying, 
uh, nobody's ever done that. Man, this is amazing. Yeah. And I just thought it was a matter of the right thing to do. How you were raised. But, yeah. yeah. And so that guy called the Jonathan Demi, who directed Swing Shift, and I got that part. And I, you know, did you have to go in and read and do the whole? The whole I did. So, so you're learning how to audition. You're learning. You're yeah. learning how the, how the system and, works. And my first agent was <clears throat> this is before CAA and WME, but my first agent was a partner at ICM because his girl, his her boyfriend was the director of Forty Eight Hours, and he said, "Is Walter Hill, who's famous as yeah. shit." Walter's chomping on a cigar going, kid, you know, you, you need, you, you got your SAG card? And I said, no. He said, you want one? I go, yeah. And so that's how I got in 48 hours. Yeah, yeah. And um, I met him. So on he, a, he got you your SAG card by doing. By doing 48 yeah. hours. And did you get a voucher on the the Kurt thing or? I did. Yeah, yeah. But it was less than five lines. Yeah, yeah. Right. And um, he goes, kid, you, you know, Walter goes, you want, you need an agent? You got one? I go, no, I don't have one. He goes, here, call this number. You know, and it was his girlfriend who was a partner at ICM. And she hit pocket you? Took took me, took you took, on? I went in for a meeting and there was 14 agents in a conference room staring at me. And I'm like, I didn't even know who ICM was. I thought, what? why are all these people yeah, in here? Like, and they what, were all, what do you guys do exactly? They were all agents. And I didn't know what, I didn't even know what agents did. Right, totally. And I didn't know that ICM was as big as they were. Yeah. You're walking in. Just don't break, okay? No one breaks. Right, here. right, right. How many cameras? <laughs> and um, one of the agents jumped up and he goes, what are you doing at three o'clock today? And I go, I don't know. And he goes, well, I got an audition for you. And it was for the lead in a movie. And I went, I went. And the other actors in that room, I didn't know. I'd never auditioned for shit, yeah, yeah. really. The other actors were Dennis Quaid and Kevin Costner and Ed Harris. And I'm looking around the room going, thinking, why am I here? You, know? you knew who they were at that yeah, time. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't meet them, but I, I knew. Yeah. You're and, sitting uh, in the waiting room. With yeah, them, with fuck. That. And I'm, I'm just like, so anyway. Long story short, um, I I got cast in a movie by a great director, uh, and we I assume you didn't get the three o'clock appointment with uh, Dennis Quaid. I, did, I didn't get, <laughs> get that movie. That <laughs> Dennis got that movie. Okay. Um, but anyway, I did those small parts, and then I got cast in a movie that was kind of a big deal. It was a it was a rat uh, brat pack movie uh, with Demi Moore and Rob Lowe and Judd Nelson and all these people. And I was supposed to play Demi's husband, and he was a saxophone player. And that that movie was about music and all this and these young couples. And and so my ICM thought that this is great. This is going to launch Todd. It's a great part. It's blah blah blah. Well, you know, six months prior to that, I'd gone to hear a guy speak who was a director named Lawrence Kasdan at the, he spoke at the Academy of Motion Pictures. And I had seen his first movie called Body Heat in the theater. Mm -hmm. And I thought, man, what a movie that was. And I thought Mickey Rourke was the shit yeah, in that movie. Yeah, he was. And the movie was great. Yeah, yeah. And I, I thought, I want to go hear that guy speak. So I got a ticket and I went. And at the end of it, somebody, they, they took questions yeah. and answers. And somebody goes, what are you working on now? He goes, well, I'm finishing up a script I'm writing with my brother. And it's a Western called Silverado. And I want to direct that next. So the thing breaks up. We go out in the lobby and I elbow my way through about 50 people. And I introduce myself to Larry Kasdan. And I've now done three movies with him and worked with his son on a different thing. And, and I introduced myself and I said, I'm from Texas, man. I, I, I sure would like to do Silverado. And I didn't know that you weren't really supposed to say shit like that to people. And uh, I said, and by the way, I can ride that shit out of a horse. And he, goes, he starts laughing. He goes, okay, it's great to meet you, Todd. Six months later. I get cast in St. Elmo's Fire. And a month after that, my agent calls me in a panic and says, hey, we just got a director's request for you. you can you make it to Warner Brothers at three o'clock today? And I go, yeah, for, for what? She goes, it's a movie called Silverado. And I went, I will be there. So I go at three o'clock and the head of casting at Warner Brothers, who I did not know, came out to meet me, you know, and said, introduced herself and she's still a friend of mine today too 
and walks me back into this office. And there's Lawrence Kasdan and his brother and the producer and the casting director sits down, who's the head of casting at Warner Brothers. And I'm looking around this room like, wow, wow. And Larry Kasdan says, Todd, how you doing, buddy? And gives me a big hug and a handshake. He goes, sit down, let's talk. So what's, what's happened in your, in your life? And I told him about these three the movies, movies yeah, I had done, done, right? And, and so you're, I, you're qualifying, you're getting credibility. Right, yeah. that I, I'd gotten cast in St. Elmo's Fire. And he's like, this is great. We said, well, look, I, I wanted, I remember in our conversation, I want you to be in Silverado and I've got a part for you. And I said, do you, do you want me to re read the script? He goes, no, I want you to be in the movie. <laughs> And the casting director's looking at me with this big smile on her face. And I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there going, this is not how this works. Yeah, yeah, this I'm supposed to audition. Yeah, right? yeah. I'm, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. He goes, no, no, I want, you to be, I want you to be in the movie. And I got a role. You're going to play a deputy. Um, it's a great part. It's not a huge part, but it's a great part. And, and um, I think I'm going to ca cast a, an actor named John Cleese as the sheriff in, in the town of Silverado. And I went, this is great, great. And he goes, well, great. I appreciate you coming by. I wanted to say hello and and uh, welcome to Silverado. So I go back to my house. I mean, just floating, just floating to your well, car. I float to the car. Yeah. I go to a phone and call my agency and I go, dude, you're not going to believe this, but Lawrence Kasdan just offered me a role in Silverado and I didn't even have to audition. And the agency goes, what? Yeah. And I go, yeah, it's awesome. They go, well, great. We're going to get the offer. So the next day they get the offer from Warner Bros. Yeah. And my agent calls me and says, I got great news and bad news. And I go, what? And they, she said, the great news is they want you for like seven weeks on Silverado. And it's a good part. Yeah. The bad news is it conflicts with St. Elmo's Fire and you can't do Silverado. You're already under contract. They hang up the phone. I go into this massive, like, head in my hands kind of moment. I like, I'm in a panic because I wanted to do Silverado yeah, yeah, so bad. Sure. It's, it's been almost a year right. since I had heard him speak, like seven months. Not only that, I mean, you're a huge Western fan. I'm a Western guy. Yeah. And um, I let two or three days go by, and I've got both off, go, both contracts. And I call my agent and I go, hey, I, I have a question to ask Joel Schumacher, who's going to direct St. Elmo's Fire. And she goes, I knew you were going to call me. You, under no fucking circumstances can you call Joel Schumacher and try to get out of that contract. I knew you were going to make this phone call. I go, uh, I just have, she hangs up the phone. So I call another agent who was on the team at ICM, not my point person. And I go, hey, man, I, I got a question to ask Joel Schumacher on St. Elmo's Fire, and I need to call him. Can I get his phone number? And he goes, hey, dude, I already got that memo. You're not fucking calling Joel Schumacher to get out of this contract. So I, I, I went to church. I literally went to a church and talked to a priest, like, what should yeah, I do? Yeah. What do I do? And I called the head of the talent department at ICM who hadn't gotten the memo. And I go, man, I need to call Joel Schumacher. I, I got a question for him about my character. Can I have his phone number? And he gave it to me. And I called Joel Schumacher at home. I took a deep breath. And I knew you weren't supposed to do this. Yeah. And I called him. And I got him on the phone. And he goes, Todd, Todd, it's so great to hear from you. What's up? And I go, listen, man, I just want to say off the, the front end here how grateful I am for you. And that you saw something in me and cast me to be in your movie. And I, I'm excited. He goes, well, what, what's up? And I go, well, I, I, I got something I need to talk to you about. And it's important. And he goes, let's go. So I tell him about meeting Lawrence Kasdan eight months earlier in Silverado. And that I've gotten an offer to be in Silverado. And it conflicts with St. Elmo's Fire. And there's silence on the phone. And he goes, are you calling me to ask me to let you out of your contract? And I took a deep breath and I said, I am. And I wouldn't do it if it weren't important. And I'll follow whatever you say. If you say no, I'm doing St. Elmo's fire. But I, I called you to tell you 
that I believe doing Silverado is my destiny. And I think you can get any one of a dozen actors to play Demi's husband in that movie and probably do it better than I can. But I think Silverado is my destiny. And there was silence on the phone. And he said, young man, let me ask you two questions. First off, let me say to you, I appreciate your passion. And I appreciate the fact that you've got large cojones to make this phone call to me. And uh, he goes, let me ask you, did everybody at your agency tell you not to make this phone call? I said, oh, yeah, to a man, every one of them. And he laughed. He laughed. He said, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to let you out of your contract. I think you ought to go make Silverado. I'm a big believer in fate and a big believer in destiny. And I don't think you've made the wrong decision. I think you've made the right decision. (laughs) So you go do that movie. And and you and I will do another movie down the road. And I wrote this whole story and that whole conversation on social media when he died a year or so. Yeah, yeah, I remember. A year or two ago. And I called my agent and told him, and they flipped Flipped out. They fucking blew a gasket. Like, what? God, you know. And- we got, I got out of it, and I went off to do Silverado, and that, that I was right. It yeah. was my destiny. Yeah. This I'm, Horizon makes my seventh movie with Costner yeah. by the time I'm done with it. And I, I, I've done three movies with Lawrence Kasdan since then. And I got my first starring role in a movie, which was Witchboard, and I had the starring role. Yeah. Because I had shot Silverado, and it wasn't out, and the producers – overlooked some actors with bigger credits than me because they thought Silverado was going to be a big deal. Yeah. And it wasn't even out yet. Yeah. yeah. So it did change my life. Yeah, for sure. So sometimes you got to follow your, your gut. And and you want to talk a little bit about that? That's amazing. Uh, You want to talk a little bit about that first meeting with Kevin or? Uh, Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a great story. Um, uh, I, a huge agent from ICM flew with me to to Santa Fe. Yeah. And I didn't know why. And I learned later on that they were trying to get Kevin to, and I had never met Kevin. Right. But that's the reason she flew with me. I'm thinking, why, wow, why is this huge agent going with me? She wanted to try to. Yeah. She was like, you know, a partner, senior partner, founder kind of a thing. Right. And, um, so we get there and she goes, listen, we're, we're, we're invited tonight to this dinner party that Lawrence Kasdan is throwing for the producers and all the cast and, and you know, everybody's going to be there. So we're going. So I get there. It's like 12 degrees. It's November. I get there. It's like 12 degrees and snowing and I've got like a windbreaker. I've got no clothes. So I had like 800 bucks in my pocket. And I, I literally, it's five o'clock in the afternoon. By the time we get there, the dinner party starts at 6.30 or so. And I run into the plaza, at which is close to where I'm staying in Santa Fe. And there's one store that hasn't closed, locked up for the night. And it's the most expensive sheepskin store on the planet. I can't think of the name of it, but you know, you know it. It's a famous one. They've got stores all over the yeah. place. Like there's one in Beverly Hills. Yeah. And I run in there and they're closing up, but they haven't locked it up yet. And I go, I need a coat, dude. I need a coat. It's cold. And so they put this sheepskin jacket on me that had this big fur, this sheepskin collar on it. And it was this great jacket. And it was like 700 bucks plus tax. And I shell out almost every penny I've got in my pocket. And I got that coat. And I show up at that dinner party. And everybody's there, and it's Danny Clover and Kevin Klein and Scott Glenn and, uh, you know, Jeff Goldblum and Costner and, you know, all the people, all the people. And Kasdan is there, and Larry jumps up, and he goes, hey, everybody. And John Cleese was there. He goes, everybody, this is Todd Allen. He's going to play, play Deputy Kern, who's John uh, Cleese's deputy in Silverado. Everybody give him a round of applause and welcome, Todd. And all these actors are sh- clapping and, sh- you know, you high-fiving me. Cheap jacket <laughs> and my hair is long like this. And I get my big coat on and I'm thinking, I'm looking around that room going, oh, my yeah, God. Yeah. Oh, my God. You know, how, how did I get here? Yeah. So I have to work my way down the table. And we have the dinner party and everybody's chit-chatting. And, you know, as it's starting to wrap up, Costner, being Costner, has worked his way around to talk to everybody. Right. 
And, you know, he remember, he wasn't a huge star yet because the industry knew he was going to be a big thing, but he wasn't known right. to the public because he got cut out of the big chill. Yeah. Like completely. Yeah. And Lawrence Kasdan basically crafted Silverado around his role f- for him. You know, he didn't write, write, he wanted to write a Western, but he built the role of Jake for Kevin as a, you know, payment, repayment for, you know, having to cut him out of the big chill. And so Kevin works his way down the table and we're, we're basically the same guy, right? He's a few years older than me and he had some work under his belt and, and everybody knew he was going to be a big star, but. But you had heat too, probably. I mean, I mean, a little bit. I mean, I mean, I had done small parts up until then. Silverado was going to be. St. Elmo's Fire was pretty good, but Silverado was even a better part. Yeah. And uh, Kevin works his way down the table and leans over and smacks me. and goes, hey, buddy. He goes, how you doing, man? I said, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. He goes, listen, after this thing breaks up, let's go get a drink. Want to? And I go, yeah. <laughs> so, so party breaks up. Long story short, Costner and I, who didn't even drink, uh, at least not today, we go to this swanky bar, this steakhouse with a separate bar in Santa Fe. It was a big thing. It was called, ah, oh, dang it. I can't remember the name of it. It was a steakhouse. The blue agave, the green something. Right. I, can't, I can't remember what it was. So anyway, we're sitting in the bar, which is across this walkway. It's a blizzard. It's 12 degrees. You can't even see. We're sitting at the bar. I'm drinking straight bourbon. I don't remember what Kevin drank. And there's in the back, there's these a bigger room with a couple of pool tables and we want to play a game of pool. So I go back and put, you know, two quarters on the table, right? right? Trying to get the next game. And there's a couple of big dudes playing a game of pool. Well, this girl works her way over to us at the bar and she's chatting Kevin up, right? And she didn't really know who he was. She just knew, I mean, everybody knew that there was movie stars right. in town and she kind of figured, um, and who knows, but she was chatting him up. And I keep checking the back room, right, looking at the pool table. And after a bit, you know, order another round of drinks. She says to Kevin, hey, I'm a nurse. I have to get up at like 530 in the morning. And my car is out in the back in the parking lot. Would would you mind walking me out to my car? It's, it's, it's dark out there and it's slippery. And would you mind? And Kevin goes, no, no, I'll walk you out to your car. And he puts his coat on, right? He's doing the gentlemanly thing. Yeah. So I'm, he walks her out. They go out the back door. I check the pool tables and those two dudes are no longer playing pool. They've got their coats on and I see them unscrew their pool cues and slide the stick up their coat sleeve. And I think to myself, holy shit, here we go. Yeah. And I, and they walk out the back door and I, I slam down, you know, some straight bourbon, put on my big sheepskin coat. Take a deep breath. And I, you know, I used to be a golden gloves fighter. I was a state champion, middleweight. So I, I know my way around a bar fight, but these guys were pretty big. Right. And Kevin's, you know, skinny like me. I mean, I was all of 170 pounds at that point. I walk out the back door and it's on a landing and there's like six steps down to the parking lot and about 60 feet out. Kevin's at that girl's car trying to put her in the car. And they're walking towards Kevin and Kevin looks up, sees them, sees me. And there was a bare light bulb over my head on the porch. And so I'm, I'm in silhouette and my hair's long and I've got the big collar up on my sheepskin. And I looked, I looked bigger than I was. Yeah, yeah. And Kevin sees them and then he sees me and he goes, and he puts the girl in the car and he goes, is there, a, is there a problem? And the two dudes, and he's looking at me and the two dudes turn around and now they see me behind them up on that landing in my sheepskin. And I mustered up the deepest voice I could for a 23-year-old and went, <clears throat> no, man, there's no fucking problem here tonight. And the, the two dudes look at each other and they skate. They leave. And I, I take a deep breath, man. And I go back in the bar and sit down, take off my coat and a, 30 seconds later, here comes Kevin and his eyes are like this big. And he goes, dude, those guys were going to kick up 
my ass. And I go, no, they were going to kick both our asses. He goes, you just saved my ass. I said, I did. And we have been like that. joined at the hip, man. That was 41 years yeah. ago, wow. this coming November. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let's get into Horizon a bit. Tell me a little bit about who you play. and Man, Horizon's been such a journey. You know, Kevin first sent me this script almost 20 years ago, and it was just one movie. And then he rewrote it as a miniseries and then he rewrote it again as four individual feature films but you you probably know this that when after the fourth one's been in the theater he's going to cut the whole thing into one hour episodes and run it on hbo as a limited 12 part series and that's never been done before so hollywood's kind of all a buzz about that aspect of it but you know he's kevin being kevin um he just called me one day two and a half years ago now and said, hey, buddy, um, I'm getting Horizon ready to go, and I want you to do it, and I've got a role in mind for you. You know, it's it's not a lead role, but it's a good role, and it's in all four of the movies, and I, I just want you to do it. I said, I'll, you just tell me when to show up, buddy. So long comes, you know, March of 2022, so more than two years ago. I get the phone call, right? They they've already sent the contract to my agent, and uh, I, you know I don't know when my start date is, but they called me a little bit early because they were having bad weather. So I I started, I went, flew to Utah, and the whole I, thing takes place in Utah. Yeah, well, the, that's where we're shooting the whole thing, but it's a wagon train epic. Yeah, yeah. at least the first two the movies trailers are fucking phenomenal. It's it's epic. Yeah, it's, it's big stuff. Yeah. And what I didn't know was every time we're shooting the wagon train and it's moving and we're in, you know, they, they would tell us, look, we're going to be in a different part of the country here. And I'm, so I, I, there was a guy on set that was the visual effects guru at all times. And he's setting the frame of some of the stuff because he knows where the points are that he's going to mark up on blue screen or right. green screen. And he would tell me, yeah, all those mountains, that it looks like Utah because we're shooting every day in Utah. Right. But we're taking all that out, and that's going to be green grass and wildflowers as far as the eye can see, and it's going to be the plains of Kansas. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, we're spending a shit ton of money to make this look like you're going through the country on your way west. So Luke Wilson and I are basically, Luke's really the wagon train leader, but I'm kind of the second in command of it. And I play a character called Buckout. And Buckout is like a fixer, right? I, I'm, and it, many times, if I'm not the lawman, I'm a gunfighter. Yeah. And in this case, I'm not. And uh, in movie number two, I actually get to kill, I, I kill a guy that is a bad dude. And I'm not used to it, so it throws me for a loop. I get super emotional about it, and you know, I think that the the guys on the wagon train are they're considering whether or not to hang me. Yeah, I don't want to give movie two away right, right. here, but um, and then Luke Wilson comes over and says, "No, no, no, they're they're reasonable people, man." And we have this. It's my favorite scene in in any of the two that I've shot so far is that moment with Luke. We have a great moment there. And uh, did it in one take because Kevin, we're rolling like five and six cameras. And there was a moment where I looked, L Luke sits down and gets me to sit down. And I looked back over his shoulder out to this area by the river where I had killed that guy. And I'm just looking at it. And Kevin, we're in a rehearsal. And Kevin walks over and says, I, I, I love that, man. I'm going to put a camera back there. Because there's five and six cameras. Yeah. Each of us have a single, there's a double, there's a wide shot, and then he puts a camera back to catch me when I look back at the river. And he goes, I'm going to shoot that. It's perfect. It's so right for you to look back like that. I love it. And I went, okay, man. So we start that scene. Luke gets me to sit down, and I look back. And I, I just I took my time. I, I'm looking back at where I killed that guy, and it doesn't sit well with me. And and I I've said when Luke walked up, I jump up because my head's in my hands, and I hear him coming, and I look and I see the guys by the campfire, and I go, you 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 told him right, you you told him what that guy was doing, 
and I don't want to give it away. Right, right. He was a, a drifter, right. bad dude. Got you. Got to go see movie two to find out. <laughs> it comes out August sixteenth. Uh, anyway, I we shot that scene, man, and I look back like I I wanted to, and then I apologized to Luke for doing what I did, and he says just. It's, we're okay, man. He goes, listen, just do your job. We're just trying to get to Horizon. Yeah. We're going to this fictional place yeah, yeah. called Horizon. I said, okay. And uh, anyway, Kevin gets off the monitors and walks over and puts his hand on me and Luke. And he goes, I'm not even going to shoot coverage. That was perfect. We're moving on, buddy. And it was Midnight out yeah. in the middle of the desert somewhere with a fire campfire yeah, going. Amazing. It was awesome. Yeah. It's my favorite moment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But the you know, Horizon for me is the first two movies anyway, while we're trying to reach Horizon and we don't even know if it's real. The people have got these flyers that say come to Horizon. Right. And we don't even know if it's real. And Danny Houston has a has a great part in this. And Danny and so does Michael Rooker. Um Danny Houston plays an army colonel. And we pull in on our journey to the army camp, the fort, and we walk into the colonel's office and he has chairs for us. And he tells us, look, I don't know what you people are thinking. And I don't know where you're telling those people that are you're leading on that wagon train you're going. But he holds up the flyer and goes, this place doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. And the Apache are going to come down and scalp you and burn you out. But my advice to you is keep going up that river and cross that river and build yourself a settlement because this doesn't exist. And we've been on the road for like six months at this yeah, point yeah. trying to reach that place. Yeah. And I'm looking at Luke and he's looking at me and we're like, holy shit. What if he's telling the truth? And Will Patton's in there with us, and he's on that wagon train too. And you know, Will's just he's such a great actor, and he's got a great part in this movie. And Luke Wilson, everybody knows Luke, and I have never seen Luke Wilson play a character like this. And my prediction, and I've told him this to his face, is that this movie is going to change his career for him if he wants it to yeah. and I, I don't know if he does but i'm but he plays a great character as the leader of this wagon train and he has to make some very hard decisions on the way of, of, of this journey and you know kick people out and run them off and deal with death and destruction right. and the indians and you know the, the the you know i'm the guy that rides up and you know part of the reason kevin wanted <laughs> Part of the reason Kevin wanted me to play Buck Out is because I'm not sitting on a wagon. Neither is Luke. We're both horseback. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm very good on a horse, man. And so I get there and, you know, uh, I think the costume department or the props department is going to have spurs for me because they I, I, I've collected spurs from all the Westerns right. I've done. And I get there. And the first thing for my wardrobe fitting, and the first thing I go is, are there some spurs I can look at? And she goes, oh, yeah, no, nobody on this movie's wearing spurs. Nobody. And I went, oh, why? She goes, well, it's a, it's a rule. Nobody's getting spurs. We've got PETA on set, and nobody's getting spurs. So I, I go, okay, okay. So I'm trying to, I'm, I'm thinking about calling my wife and having her FedEx a set of spurs to me. And I mean, I still have my spurs from Silverado yeah, yeah. 40 years ago. And um, I go get my props, I pick out my gun belt, my thing. And, and I, I, uh, I asked the prop guy, have you guys got any spurs? And he goes, oh man, look, nobody's wearing spurs on this movie. And I'm like, okay. So I go to my buddy who's been Kevin's stunt double for 35 years and has doubled me in six or seven movies. I've known this guy since, you know, before Wyatt Earp. His name's Norman Howell. Norman just retired after the first Horizon. A great guy. And uh, I go, Norm, can I ask you a question, buddy? He goes, yeah. I go, what's the deal on the Spurs? He goes, oh, fuck. 
oh, fuck. Nobody gets spurs. I go, dude, I need spurs. Kevin's asked me to, I got to do a lot of horse work on this movie. And A, I'm going to go handpick my horse. I'm not taking some nag. And he goes, buddy, I, I know. I've seen you ride. I know. So he texts me a, 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 a contact out of his phone. He goes, that's what, who you need to call. And it was a store in Colorado, four hours away, that has antique spurs. And I still had two or three days before I started shooting. And it was a, that was a Friday. And so the next day, it was a Saturday. So I, I called that store and I go, are you guys open tomorrow? She goes, oh, yes, sir, we're open. And great. Hang up. The next day, I get up. I drive to Colorado and go buy a set of antique spurs. So my first day of filming, I walk out on set in full wardrobe and, uh, you know, with those spurs on because they want me to show Kevin what my full right. wardrobe looks like. And Kevin looks down, sees the spurs, and he gives me a, a grin because he knows me. And he goes, have you met Scotty the Wrangler? I go, no, but I need to because I want to pick my horse out. And he goes, I know you do, asshole. So he gets on the radio and goes, hey, can you get somebody get Scotty over here? And I hadn't worked with Scotty before, but I but his former boss was a guy that I'd been working with since Wyatt Earp, great wrangler named Rusty Hendrickson. And, you know, Rusty had taken ill, and so Scotty stepped in to run run the Wranglers. And he's great. So Scotty comes over. He goes, Scotty, Kevin goes, Scotty, I want you to meet Todd Allen. He's playing Buck out and he needs to pick a horse. Cause I'm going to ask him to do some, you know, pretty serious horse work in this thing. Scotty says, no problem. No problem, man. He sticks out his hand. We shake hands. And I go, Scotty, it's nice to meet you. And he's got his hand like this and he's looking at my wardrobe and he sees the spurs and he doesn't say anything. Cause I'm standing there with Kevin and Kevin puts his arm around me and he goes, and by the way, I love his fucking wardrobe. <laughs> Scotty goes, Yes, sir. I do too. Yeah. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> you know, problem solved. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm wearing spurs, man, because I do some serious. I mean, I am. I am at full speed, whipping, oh, yeah. spurring on this thing. You know, running up alongside the wagons. And there's a scene that Luke and I did in movie one, where I, I mean, the wagon train's moving. There's thirty or forty wagons with teams. And I'm coming up on the inside, and Luke's on the outside, and he pulls up to a stop. And Luke ride, or he had he had a double, or he hadn't ridden a lot. He had, he did his own riding, but he took lessons. Yeah, and yeah. I've worked with him quite a bit too, just on how to do things for camera. Yeah, not so much, you know, the Wranglers, which is were totally showing different. Him right, how to, yeah, right. I and mean, camera's different. Yeah, I mean, you gotta you gotta know to put the reins down on the horse's neck when you hit your mark, so he knows. A lot of actors, they're, if they're nervous, right, they're, they're they're holding the reins tight and they're t using their heels and the, the horse gets confused and starts to move and right. it ruins the shot. Especially if you're on a medium or a tight and it's your all over and, the frame. And, and um, yeah. oh, I can't think of the actor. God dang, he was famous. But he taught me that over the phone when I was, I got cast in Silverado. Oh, wow. And uh, the famous actor, um, oh, Harry Carey Jr., who did all those John Wayne movies, including The Searchers, I had done a movie called Mask with Eric Stoltz yeah, yeah. and Cher. Yeah. And Harry Carey was in that movie. And I asked him, dude, how do I, I'm, I'm doing a lot of writing in Silverado and what do I need to do? And he goes, well, when you, you know, lower the stirrups a little bit so that when you go to get up on it, you get your foot in the stirrup and you mount that saddle do it slowly like think jack palance in shane yeah. remember how slow he got on on and off that horse it's powerful and when you hit your mark put your hand down on his neck put the reins down on his neck so he knows stay it's a stay i go man that's great and he goes well i'm sitting here having a drink with one of the best cowboys ever let me put him on the fucking phone and it was um Oh, I can't think. I can't. I cannot remember his name. Is the guy that was Oscar nominated or for uh, the Gray Fox, the famous famous actor? Okay. Um, it'll come to me. I'll say it when we get done here. But he puts him on Richard Farnsworth. 
He puts Richard Farnsworth, who was a stuntman and a cowboy, on the phone. And Richard's given me all these tips. So I, that's how I learned how to do it yeah, for camera. Yeah. I was already good as a right, horseman. Yeah. That's but amazing. anyway, so I'm I'm blazing up alongside the wagon at full speed. And before they started rolling the wagons, Kevin, you know, is on the walkie talkie and I've got one in my back in my saddlebag. He goes, Todd, back up further, back up further. Well, the timing, the scene is what I say to Luke when we're stopped on our marks at the end of it. So Kevin keeps backing me up and backing. I'm thinking, son of a bitch, I'm going to have to haul ass here. So he backs me up, backs me up, backs me up. And all of a sudden of the bullhorn, I hear, I hear action. The wagon team says, yeah, and the wagons start rolling. And man, I've got my horse ready to go. And I start flying. I mean, flying. Because at some point, I have to cut between two moving wagons wow. and a team of horses. And horses don't like doing that. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Don't, they don't like it. And I, wouldn't, I didn't rehearse it, so I didn't know if it was going to go badly or not. But as I'm coming along the side of the wagon, shit, there's giant cactuses and boulders. And I'm, I, I just give him his head, you know, and, and hit the spurs a little bit. And my horse jumped over that shit at full speed. And I had to pick my point because I see I can see where Luke has moved over to the marks and come to a stop. And I just had to pick a moment. And there these wagons are moving and the horses are going. And I just turned him and, and kicked it, kicked him right through between these two wagons. Well, I'm at full speed and Luke is right there. And I I literally had to pull back so hard that my horse skidded, skidded, skidded to the mark. And I hit that mark, and Luke and I have our di dialogue. <laughs> and what we're seeing is there's there was a a a, a brave uh, you know a, a, an Indian yeah, yeah. on top of the hill. I think if they were Apache, I can't. They might, they might have been Comanche. And Luke goes to me, "Did you see that brave up there?" And I go, "Yeah, except for now, there's two of them." And I had seen the second one while I'm flying up alongside the wagon train. And so that was kind of our moment. Yeah, yeah. And and Kevin gets off the off the monitors and walks over to him and he goes, Do you have to come in that fucking fast? <laughs> I go, dude, you backed me up yeah. into Oklahoma. <laughs> so we did it like four or five times. That's amazing. It was crazy. That's amazing. When, so when's it coming out? Uh, June 28th, man. Okay. Coming in June 28th. It's okay. going to be in the theaters in two weeks. Okay. That's exciting. Yeah, dude. I'm going to LA, uh, uh, for the premiere, um, which is on the 24th and taking my wife. We're have gonna, you seen it yet? Yeah, I've not seen the, the movie. Okay. I did some looping about two weeks ago and, um, but most of that was for man, movie that trailer two. looks amazing. It looks so good. Yeah. I think they're going to drop the movie two trailer pretty okay. quick because awesome. it comes out six weeks later we'll have to have you back when movie two comes out yeah man you, this is this is we've gone long and uh i know th this sorry. Is, no you're great man there's so many great stories so we'll have to come back and talk some more because uh i, I want to there's so much i want to talk about yeah no let's do it i mean t i, I kind of figured today it'd be a, a more about horizon and i'm glad it was but yeah, yeah. I, you know we can we, we, i got plenty of stuff awesome man thank you brother okay buddy appreciate it thank you thank you our show today was recorded in studio by the good folks at Record ATX. Check them out at recordatx.com. Our theme music is produced by Jonathan Price. You can check out some of the sounds he makes with his project, The Mid Cities, on Spotify. Follow, subscribe, and smash that like button if you see one. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you guys next time.